Um, but I'd like to extend a, a warm welcome uh, to everyone that's uh, joined us today. Um, it's a stunning day out there and uh, certainly in Melbourne uh, it is and um, uh, hopefully you're comfortable um, and uh, ready for the panel discussion today, um, which will be for 45 minutes. Um, before we get started um, with the panel discussion, uh, I'd like to um, uh, take, time, take the time to acknowledge the traditional custodians uh, of the land in which we're meeting today. I would like to pay my respects to the elders past, present and emerging. I'm Marty Rechko, uh, Principal at Mercer Evolve. Uh, as some of you may know, uh, Evolve was acquired by Mercer over two years ago now. And uh, we continue to work in the talent consulting domain and uh, we have a particular focus on talent intelligence uh, applied in areas such as talent mapping, acquisition, pipelining, uh, diversity intelligence and uh, succession risk management. Um, everyone uh, is experiencing uh, very rapidly changing conditions uh, in our space and uh, we're very pleased to bring you the first of uh, four webinars uh, discussing how organisations are reinventing the new shape of work. Uh, we have four very topical webinars uh, coming up over the next uh, little while uh, to the end of August, in fact. Uh, so keep your eye out for future events. Um, but today um, we have uh, a really interesting panel session uh, focusing on critical talent uh, and the future of sourcing, uh, something that's uh, near and dear to our hearts. And um, among other topics today, we'll be exploring how organisations are thinking differently about their critical talent. Uh, how organisations are changing the way they actually source that talent and uh, what the critical skills are uh, for the workforce of the future uh, that we're rapidly moving towards. Um, without further ado, uh, I'd like to introduce uh, the people here uh, with me, uh, the panellists today. Uh, first of all, there's um, Gareth Jones. Um, so Gareth leads the, uh, the Mercer Evolve business and was one of the founders of Evolve Intelligence. Um, he spent uh, his entire career in talent consulting and executive search. Uh, next, Vicky Hartley. Uh, Vicky leads Mercer uh, Evolve's education practice and more broadly uh, brings together Mercer's HR uh, capability um, uh, in, into the sector. And um, Vicky came to Evolve after being one of our clients where she led an internal talent function. So we're very pleased to have Vicky with us today as well. Uh, Jared Hall, Jared, Jared is a principal at uh, Mercer Evolve and leads many of our uh, large executive uh, talent sourcing, mapping and succession projects. And uh, Jared has spent his career in this space as well and brings uh, a lot of knowledge to this discussion. Finally, James Harrison. James uh, heads up our uh, research function. Um, he spent his career in the industry as well uh, specifically, though, focusing on uh, the research aspect of, uh, uh, of what we do. Uh, talent research and sourcing practices is uh, his domain and um, spends a lot of time uh, innovating um, and uh, looking forward. So uh, looking forward to um, a great discussion with the panel. Uh, but importantly, we're uh, really keen to have some interaction with you today. Um, and the way that we uh, will be doing that is through Zoom, of course. Um, most of us uh, have probably used Zoom before and are familiar with the Q&A box. Um, Q&A, uh, please use that box to post a question to the speakers and do that at any time and we'll um, try to answer all the questions um, during the course of this webinar. Also use the chat box. Uh, the chat box is there um, to share your experiences with us and the wider audience today. Um, when you do so, uh, please make sure that you select um, uh, sending the message to all panelists and attendees so we can um, see what your thoughts and experiences are. Um, one final point on Zoom, uh, we won't be using the raise hand function uh, for this session. So again, please ask lots of questions um, at any time uh, during the course of the webinar. Um, so to really get things moving um, with the panel, um, I'd like to, uh, to get, get the session rolling with a question for Vicky actually. Um, and, and the question um, 
there's Vicky. Uh, are, are organisations thinking differently about their critical talents? Uh, and has the definition of critical talents uh, shifted due to what we've seen uh, because of COVID? Yeah, thanks, Marty. The, um, th the definition of critical talent is shifting. And, and look, it will continue to shift as we move through COVID and, and the, the economy changes, the new shape of the workforce um, starts to emerge. Organisations have been presented with an immediate opportunity and a need to truly understand their existing workforce, um, which will it actually allows them to utilise the skills that the current employees have that they might be able to use outside of their existing kind of business as usual role. Um, this, this could be through internal redeployment or, or just the organisation kind of needing to do more with less. But what that inevitably leads to is the organisation need needing to redefine what critical talent actually means to them. Great, thank you very much, Vicky. Um, Gareth, do you have any further perspective on, um, on that question, uh, how organisations are thinking differently? Um, yeah, I do. I echo, obviously, what um, Vicky just talked about. And as, as we know, the pandemic's caused great trauma around the world and um, the economic fallout is going to be equally painful for many people all, all around the world. And it's going to be, it's very tempting to focus on the short term um, crisis management um, at this moment in time. And um, uh, when we emerge from this tragedy, um, it'll be the sort of the bold um, long term thinkers that not only survive, but thrive. Um, so sort of well capitalized visionary organizations going to see this as a bit of a a time to sort of increase the, the greatness of their organization as they go forward. So um, following on from Vicky, I think the trick is, um, is not to ex ignore the sourcing, retaining and the development of that critical talent. Um, how you review and, um, and evaluate that existing key critical um, players in your organization is going to be key. Um, and staying closer to them now is going to be more critical than ever. Um, you know, you're going you're gonna to need to help them move from the potential to success with, with targeted development, um, you know, including the, the type of stretch assignments that really emerge in, in the, um, the, the times of crisis. I think that's one of the key things that really organizations need to try and uncover what those stretch assignments can be for those, those individuals. Um, you know, the current situation, competitors are going to be circling your organization. Um, you know, the talent that is sort of rises to the top within your, within your business it, uh, you, you need to keep hold of them and um, they're the ones that are going to really help your organisation recover when, you, when we get through to the other side. Great, thanks Gareth and uh, Vicky for those observations. Yeah, definitely organisations are re-evaluating and rethinking uh, and acting uh, on that re-evaluation. Uh, Gareth, whilst uh, you're on a roll there, I have another question for you. Sure. Um, and uh, that is, um, are there any noticeable changes uh, in, in the leadership characteristics that organisations are seeking. Uh, obviously, again, because of the, the, the changes that we've seen in the market because of COVID. Yeah, look, um, I think it's not necessarily skill set shifts. Um, it's going to be more of a, um, like a mindset characteristic that organisations are really going to have to try and draw out of their leaders. Um, you know, they don't want sheep, they really want leaders. Um, you know, three months ago, you, you've got a CEO or a leader that's um, very good at the business as usual. Currently, you, you're going to have um, individuals that are really good at saving the business. And then, but what they're really going to look for from a characteristic going forward is how the organization is going to grow again, moving from that mindset of we're coping to how we're going to be going to be sustainable and continue growing, you know, um, almost use a different analogy. Um, great leaders going to bring in architects to plan the new building while firefighters are working to save the old building, you know. Um, I, think, I suppose one of, the, one of my big observations is during COVID is um, when everyone went into lockdown, it was all about people setting up their home environment to make sure it was secure, make sure the tech works, client files, ergonomic chairs, that was the focus. People were having fun, they were jumping on Zoom, going for a drink at 5 p.m. with their buddies on Zoom. You know, the Star Wars quiz was, was kicking in, so people were really being entertained. Um, now the mood shifted to nervousness and stress. Um, a lot of people thought this may be over in three months. We might be back to work, but it looks like we're going to be in this for a little while. And um, 
it looks like New South Wales might be following Vic in further restrictions, which is, which is unfortunate. So right now, people don't need drinks. They don't need quiz nights. They need leadership. Um, Organisations need to wrap their arms around their workforce right now because work, workforces are vulnerable. Um, you know, strong leadership now is what people, people need. And especially in the second wave, people are going to um, make the call whether they want to stay with the company or not if the leadership is right there. Right, thanks, Gareth. Um, Jared, uh, do you have any further perspective on that uh, that that topic? Yeah, look, absolutely. And and a lot of the organisations that uh, we've been speaking with, and they're talking around those leadership characteristics. And to further enhance what Gareth's saying, that adaptability and flexibility and versatility, you know, they're all inherent characteristics that you look for in, in leaders. But they're going to come to the they're going to come to the top. They're going to rise to be key characteristics that they're looking for. So that potential to keep on growing and, and, and learning, the, the old paradigms are, are no longer in place. So adapting to these new circumstances and someone who's really comfortable in that space. And th this is gonna really stem from some baseline, baseline attributes and their curiosity, their insight, engagement, and determination. And I think the big one is empathy and, and, and listening. You know, as Gareth just said, people are very uncertain now and you know, that ability to listen and empathize with your teams, you know, whether it's the immediate ELT, or peers and, and so on, is going to be very, very important. Right, yeah, so definitely adaptability and uh, empathy are a standout uh, points there. Uh, thank you both. Um, James, uh, a, a question for you where um, uh, we're definitely seeing rapid changes in demand conditions um, out in the market. And uh, it's obvious to us that um, there's been a drop overall, there's, there's no question, but um, I, I guess what I'd um, ask is, are there particular skill sets uh, that stand out that are in demand? And um, further to that, uh, how do we source that, you know, that in demand uh, talent right now? Uh, yeah, I, I think you're absolutely right, Marty. There, there's a lot of data coming through now from a variety of sources that are, that's really spelling out, you know, the impact that I think we're all seeing and, and we're all feeling as well. Um, and there's, there's still, you know, a lot of uncertainty, but I think one thing is, is certainly clear where we're now in, in what, what's been termed the distance economy. Um, so I think anywhere or anything associated with the, the distance economy is we're seeing kind of rising and becoming more in demand as well. So, you know, big surge in online shopping, um, delivery services and data storage as well, um, telehealth, remote learning, automation, data science, cloud, cybersecurity. So the, the, the interesting th thing for me on that is that, you know, the, these were um, growing uh, skill sets sort of before, you know, COVID hit us. Um, and it's not as if they're coming out of nowhere. I think what we're really seeing um, is that this is sort of acceleration toward or, or the actual arrival even of the, the future of work. Um, it's definitely here and, and it's being put to the test. Um, so how do we, how do we find uh, in-demand talent? How do we tap into it? I think, um, you know, we're going to be talking a lot about that over the remaining time of this, this webinar, but some thoughts of mine are really, you know, marrying the technology that is available to us whilst also holding on to, you know, the human approach and, and the, the human element. I think that word empathy has been, has, has already come up. So, you know, the technology eco ecosystem around what we do is, 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 is really quite strong and growing every day. You can look at any part of the sort of sourcing landscape, whether it's the early identification or the engagement or even the onboarding. And there's, um, you know, incredible tools out there that are going to make our lives easier and, and make, you know, getting through the noise um, faster. And I think, you know, overlaying that in, in, into the future with, with um, machine learning and AI to really cut down to what you want is going to be, it's going to be really critical. Um, but we need to pivot to what, what our target, um, our target candidate or target um, uh, individual really wants, you know, if they want a, a, a low contact, low friction, high tech sort of um, uh, process, we can do that. But at the same time, if they want you know, more FaceTime, more high touch, 
um, and to be to be you know more engaged with you as a as a as a um, a sourcer, then you know we need to respond to that as well. Right, Jimmy. Um, that's uh, it's really helpful. I guess what you're talking to there is um, personalization. Um, you know, within those talent communities that are a priority uh, for any particular organisation. Um, Jared, I was just um, wondering whether you have any further comments on that personalisation piece. Yeah, look, look, absolutely. And, and giving some thought about this, you know, giving some thought to this and on, on, the, on the flip side, perhaps those skills are easily identify, identifiable and what will come to fruition, I think, over the next six to 12 months is how do, how do the leaders of today create those leaders of tomorrow, those, those informal networks, the, uh, the corridor conversations, the ad hoc meetings, the, the watching and learning that normally takes place in an organisation which is contained often in, in, in the one building is, is going to be a really critical focus, I feel, for, for organisations as, as they move forward. So how do, how do leaders create that, that personalised environment once they have those teams you know, in a distributed workforce? So I think you know, that those are some of those key skills we're going to look for um, but are only identifiable through that, that personalised approach as we, as organisations, look to the external talent market. Great. Thanks, Jared. Um, yeah, certainly big changes on the demand side, um, as there has been on the supply side. Um, so, yeah, Vicky, on, on that point, um, could you comment on whether you've seen any noticeable shifts in candidate behaviour? Um, and uh, has, has it actually impacted sourcing activity? Yeah, look, there's definitely been a noticeable shift at the, in the candidate behaviour, particularly at the more senior level. I feel they've become a lot more curious um, in, in terms of what's going on now, whether that's to seek further information um, that they, they don't have available to them or, or whether it is because they are genuinely looking to consider um, something new for them. It, the, the latter is, is the most likely, given that there are, uh, there are a lot of kind of uncertainties um, on the horizon and, and it's opening up candidates' minds to the possibility of change. Um, it's also getting them thinking about different opportunities that might be out there and different ways of working um, as well. So look, definite, definitely a noticeable shift. Right, thanks, thanks, Vicky. Um... Jared, you're working in different markets to, to Vicky. Um, you contrast uh, that with your experience, please. Yeah, look, I've certainly seen a greater willingness from particularly senior candidates to engage on those initial, initial approaches, particularly if I can say 12 months ago, where it might have taken a little bit more work to, to mm. get passive talent. So that probably tells, tells a couple of stories that obviously people think about their immediate futures and you know, they're, they're doing their own risk management and they need to keep options on the table. No, the, the flip side to that is it might be more potentially, it might be more difficult to get top talent to move, given that the risks and who wants to perhaps shift a role when there might be changes in an organisation. So there's, there's some unknown unknowns. Um, so I, I think there's a, you know, there's a potential, you know, risk in, in that. Um, you know, also, I think, uh, you know, we're talking about candidate behaviour. I think that international market, which has often been... Australian organisations is going to be difficult to, to, to access, given that we really aren't seeing any, any indication that international borders may open. That, that said, you know, we're looking to see at seeing some expats return home, which might bring talent back into the market. They'll have some great international experience. Um, the flip side of that, though, is are there some you know, international talent based in Australia looking to move back home themselves? Although perhaps Australia has a strategic advantage in that we've been at this point, relatively unscathed uh, with COVID nineteen, and we might maybe seen as a you know a safer a safer option for people and their families. Right, thanks, Jared. Um, yeah, to everyone in the audience, keen um, on your experience as well. So uh, please use the um, uh, you know the chat function, uh, share your experience and observations around um, uh, any changes that you've seen in, in candidate behaviour and uh, how it's impacted sourcing. And uh, we'll, uh, we'll monitor that as we go through. Um, but uh, I guess a core question relating to this uh, webinar topic is, um, uh, I guess something that, um, that James uh, has a lot of experience with and um, wanted to ask him uh, what some of the trends are around 
sourcing of talent right now. Um, and uh, our organisations are uh, sourcing from new pools at the moment. Um, and uh, yeah, maybe, maybe those two components, uh, James, I'll, uh, I'll ask you to respond to. Yeah, I think, I think um, yeah, one of the major shifts, uh, you know, now is a time really to be, to be op op opportunistic and, and thinking about the future. So I think any proactive sourcing um, for, for the, the future shape of, of what the business could or is likely to be is going to be really beneficial. So, you know, building out talent pools of predicted skill sets are going to be needed on a, you know, a couple of horizons, whether it's sort of towards the end of ne next year or early, uh, sorry, towards the end of this year or early, early next year, um, reaching out and connecting with, you know, top talent that, that, you, that you see in the market, even with no immediate vacancy is going to be really beneficial. So, you know, um, connecting, building talent pools, building pipelines, um, uh, and, and having those, those preemptive conversations that are uh, more around what the, what the candidate is looking for over a slightly longer term horizon than, than um, you know, than trying to uh, potentially fill a role immediately um, uh, that, you know, is, is it probably more in that kind of respond reactive phase. So um, I think that's probably one of the biggest uh, things that we've seen and, and that we've been encouraging as well. And I think just touching on, on what Jared said, I think the international mobility piece is obviously dramatically declined. Um, and so where, you know, potentially we might have been able to look to a more mature market um, to secure, you know, a senior talent um, that, that's been that's done it before, um, or you know, a, a growing um, market for talent where we've got overflow of people wanting to leave and expand their careers. You know, we won't see that anymore. So, you know, really kind of looking at the local market and 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 in order to to uh, acquire talent in the local market, we're going to really have to respond to what they want and. You know, obviously EVP is, is important um, and it's going to become more important as we, as we sort of, um, you know, uh, div uh, diversify our thinking about what flexibility means and, and what value proposition is for a variety of different people. Um, and I guess who knows, you know, we might, see, we might see talent, you know, hired remotely that never interacts with, with head office or, or never has to relocate to Australia at all. And, I think uh, um, uh, is it the Bahamas or Bermuda is, is encouraging people to uh, to come and stay for a while and, and work from home from there. So maybe we'll see a bit of that as well. Great, thanks, James. And uh, yeah, we've had a couple of comments coming through the chat function. So uh, yeah, great, great observations. And um, yeah, just talking about uh, you know changing um, candidate behaviour. Um, so before we sort of um, look at that a bit more closely. Um, Vicky, um, question for you sort of on this topic as well is um, really around whether you're seeing organisations looking to access talent uh, working flexibly. So has that had any, any sort of changes from a sourcing perspective? Um, because that talent may have been overlooked before. So interested in your, your observations on that point. Yeah, look, I think so, particularly within the, the kind of education sector, whether that be in universities, TAFEs, um, independent schools, it's, it's opening up the possibility for that international talent to kind of work remotely. Um, and it's, it's kind of redefining that working from home into working remotely um, as well, which gives you broader access to those international talent pools. It perhaps reduces the... Um, the need for specific infrastructure in certain countries, but it also reduces that, that kind of global mobility piece um, as well that it can take to, to shift um, a, an academic member of staff from their, um, their country outside Australia to, to an institution um, in Australia. Academics tend to go where their, their research questions are. So if they're able to do that within their, their home area, um, but also still remotely teach, um, or remotely um, work with an institution here in Australia, it, it definitely opens up that, that possibility for, for new sourcing, um, new sourcing methods for the, for the organisations. 
Great, thanks, Vicky. Yeah, one of the comments in the chat was um, uh, the point about um, engagement, and uh, you know, a lot of candidates, um, you know, when directly approached, that are sort of uh, more engaged, um, you know, through uh, this this COVID period. Uh, leadership teams have placed a lot of uh, time and effort on engaging staff, so that could uh, definitely have an impact on, uh, on on candidate sourcing. So thanks for sharing that um, point. Um, Gareth, a question for you um, is around that proactive sourcing and, uh, you know, particularly around succession risk management um, and whether organisations are approaching succession differently given um, the uncertainty uh, and, and potentially not, not knowing, you know, what, uh, you know, what sort of successes they may need. Um, yeah, they, they are. Um, progressive organisations are. Um, progressive organisations have always done it really well. Um, I think some, some of our clients um, are starting to, to pick it up a, a lot better than, than, um, than they have done over, over the past. I think um, it's important to, um, act, whilst it's important to, act, to activate emergency succession planning for C-suite or, or leadership roles, um, companies now are realising they're having to devote equal attention to ensuring this um, focus on future leaders as well. So um, those are, those are key, um, a, a key critical operational roles that, that exist in your organization. Um, those leaders are gonna be a significant competitive advantage as business returns, returns to normal. When that is, nobody knows. Um, solely focus on emergency succession planning is really short-sighted um, and really not that much different to replacement planning basically. Um, the, the retaining, developing, leveraging future talent is even more important now than it was, it was even a quarter ago. So, um, you know, progressive forward thinking organizations are really, are really thinking like that. Um, you know, if anybody really wants to talk about that in more detail, we can, we can take it offline and have that, have that conversation. But, um, you know, those, those, that approach to succession, both internal and, and understanding what the external market does is, is key and a great opportunity to do it in, in this market. Right, thanks, Gareth. Uh, just quickly, Jared, um, any further perspective on uh, succession? Yeah, look, I, I think, it, you know, to echo Gareth's comments, the, the really progressive organisations are, are thinking about it and have always, have always done it. But we're certainly seeing that heightened focus, particularly on, on leadership roles and, and talking, you know, re referencing James's earlier comments around the data, technology, digital, you know, type of roles, you know, and we're going to be looking across industries as well. I think, you know, a longer term issue in Australia, we're very industry uh, focused. Okay, you must come from FMCG or so on. I, I'm seeing a, a great willingness from a lot of clients to, to look to other sectors. So your competitor for talent may not be the your direct competitor, maybe someone from outside your sector completely. So that, that only sort of further enhances the need to succession plan because somebody might move uh, to move to a different sector. Right, thank you. Um, yeah, clearly lots of, lots of changes and many of them uh, sort of happening before COVID and there's been an acceleration and, um, you know, definitely um, sort of raises uh, a question, um, you know, around talent acquisition functions and, and perhaps Vicky, um, be good to get your perspective on this, given that you, you've, uh, you've sort of been in these roles before. Um, you know, are, are you seeing any um, any shifts in the way that talent acquisition teams are structured, but also the activities that they're focusing on right now? Yeah, look, talent acquisition teams have been working for quite a while to move themselves away from that transactional recruiting function to much more of a consultative approach. Um, as we progress through, um, there, there are actually only a few teams that have got that right at this moment in time. Um, once you overlay COVID-19, um, it then actually opens up the need for organisations or for talent teams to think about their EVP, their candidates' experience, um, as well as you know, just simple things around the, how an interview has been conducted. So, there's definitely a change in the, the structure um, of those teams for sure with them moving to much more of a consultative approach, um, but also the, the activity um, absolutely is, is needing to be looked at. Right, thanks, uh, Vicky. I think um, we're, we're running on time, which is, which is good. Um, and uh, we do wanna move to 
the uh, the open Q and A. So uh, just a reminder: if you have any great questions, um, uh, please send them through. We'll uh, we'll use this uh, session now to uh, to cover them. Uh, we've had some pre-submitted questions, and uh, we've had another one uh, put through the Q and A box uh, ready. So thank you very much for that. Um, so yeah, please uh, please jump on the Q and A and send through any additional questions. Um, so actually, the, the first one here is a really interesting one. So uh, it's it's given the global BLM movement. Um, there seems to be a lot of discussion within organisations in the diversity space, including gender. Um, and uh, where do you see diversity and inclusion as a focus for now uh, and the future of talent? So yeah, awesome question. Uh, thank you very much, um, uh, Gareth. Um, yeah, or, or any, any panellist uh, that wants to add to Gareth's, Gareth's answer, um, I'll answer you first, Gareth, and then feel free to jump in, uh, anyone else. Yeah, um, thanks, Marty. Um, yeah, that's a the great question. I think um, it's very easy for organisations in, um, in this market to really think short term and um, to start thinking about how they, how they can get through this crisis without necessarily thinking of what their strategy has been over the last few years. Uh, as I mentioned, progressive organizations have really had diversity inclusion, um, both, both in gender um, and, you know, in, in all aspects of diversity. They've had that at the front of their mind for a long, long time. And um, now is not the time to forget that. I think organizations that we've been speaking to, certainly over the last few months, have, um, you know, they've, they've certainly, in, they were in the bunkers for a long time trying to sort of save their businesses. Uh, but they haven't actually forgotten what their what their um, diversity and inclusion strategies were previously. So they're now starting to think about how they can then how they can get out of those uh, out of the trenches and start moving forward with those with those um, diversity and inclusion plans that they that they had in place prior to COVID. So um, I think I don't see it changing in um, in a negative way. I see it almost see it changing in a more positive way. You know, um, the Black Lives Matter. Um, uh, movement that's going on at the moment is just going to heighten the focus on that. So I don't see any change um, negatively. I actually see it as a positive change. Thanks, Gareth. Any any other perspectives from the panel on that point? Yeah, if I if I could just say this, sorry, Mickey, is it, it'd be interesting to see what governments do in this space. And obviously, you know, we're talking about you know, sort of Western Western economies and so on. But if we just think about Australia. Will there be regulatory changes or will, given the, the current economic circumstances, will governments pull back a little bit on, on that space around uh, not just gender diversity, but ethnicity and even socioeconomic? Um, and whether shareholders associations, for example, or other lobby groups start to really put pressure on boards and executive teams around the diversity of, of, of their team. So I, I think there's a few unknowns. I think it's, yeah, it's Gareth said, it might be parked just for a little bit. The really progressive and strong organisations will keep a laser focus on it. Yeah, absolutely. And we're seeing, um, you know, certainly, um, you know, the media uh, have an impact and, uh, you know, I think um, EVP messaging uh, will continue to shift uh, with these social movements mm. underway. Uh, well, yeah, more than underway. Um, before, uh, before we go on to the next question, uh, Vicky, did you have any other perspectives on that um, and what you're seeing in higher ed perhaps? Yeah, look, the, the um, diversity and inclusion um, needs to not just be a program of work that, that exists within an organisation, the intersection between that and how um, internal employees actually embody diversity and inclusion is, is something that, that needs to really be concentrated on both now and in the future. And I think that is happening um, to a certain extent but we do need to consider that um, a, a lot better. Thanks, Vicky. Um, yeah, a, a pre-submitted question, um, James, I think this is one for you, um, and uh, I'm intrigued to, to hear your answer. Uh, how far forward um, can we forecast sourcing uh, mm -hmm. at the moment? Um, and uh, further to that, um, you know, what, what may trigger changes uh, to this horizon in future? Yeah, yeah, it's a great question, one I've been thinking about a lot and, and certainly in the last week. Um, we're sort of thinking about it in, in three horizons, you know, responding to what's going on, 
returning to some semblance of of, uh, of uh, normality and then reinventing um, the business or you know um, the the strategy for the future. So it's really important now to be trying to push into the reinvent um, stage a, a, as hard as possible, whilst also you know as we as as Gareth said at the very start, um, you know putting those fires out in the respond and return phase as well. So, so how do we get to the reinvent phase, you know, as, as TA sort of specialists, I think when it works best, it's when either we as, as providers or, or, or in-house teams are as close to the strategy of the business as a whole or the business unit that we're working with as possible and really gaining an understanding of, of where that business is, is going and where it's, it's going to be. Um, because then, as we were talking about earlier, we can start to go, okay, well, we're going to need these types of people for that future and, and really getting into that proactive talent pooling, building those relationships, even if there's not an active role right now, you know, um, making sure that you are known to them so that the next time that you, you call, they're, they're going to be more responsive, more, more compelled to action. Um, and, and you as it will have a sense of what the business strategy is so you can translate that, um, you know, really meaningfully to, to those individuals. So, um, yeah, I mean, that sort of three stage approach is sort of how we're, we're tackling it. Right. Thanks, James. Um, uh, another great question um, has come through and uh, it's, a, it's about the changing narrative. Um, so from what we had before when COVID started now, the narrative has changed and um, uh, we need to wrap our arms around people and uh, they're craving support. So the question is, um, what have your observations been uh, on mental health? Um, I fear it's a big deal and particularly as lockdown now continues. So um, could, could uh, someone on the panel maybe pick that question up uh, and comment on the mental health aspects? Um, yeah, I can, I can do that, Marty. Um, I think you know, not being a mental health expert, but certainly um, understanding um, what clients are seeing with their with their workforce. Um, the key thing really does sit with with leadership um, and how leaders react in this situation. And I think there's been a few comments here um, in the chat um, about uh, how engagement levels have gone up in this in this crisis. So um, a lot of leaders are doing it really, really well. Um, you know, I think people are going to um, really want to, to look look at their leaders to understand um, where they're going to go and, and how safe they are as individuals. And they're, they're basically craving for leaders to invest in them um, just, to, just so they know and feel that they matter. Um, not, some companies are not so good at it, but it really is about reassuring um, that talent that they, um, that the ones that they want to keep and, and all everyone within their organization that they wanted and needed, um, that's really gonna help mental health in, in um, certainly from an employment perspective. Um, and as Dean mentioned, you know, the work, workers do feel vulnerable. You know, they're not gonna know where their, their next pay is gonna come from if they, if they do lose their job. So, so that leadership, um, you know, I keep banging on about leadership, but it's such a, it's such a key part in, in, this, in this environment that um, organisations are going to really need to um, to invest in that going forward. Right. Thanks, thanks, Gareth. Um, in the uh, in the chat, we have um, a question as well. Um, I, I think to the panel and the, the wider group. Um, love to know any experiences on attraction uh, uh, and or identification of talent uh, for settings where work cannot be done at home or remotely. Um, so that's uh, quite a specific question. Some you're sort of uh, wondering if uh, anyone on the panel has any uh, perspective on that one. Otherwise, I'll need to... That's a tricky one, buddy. Um, yeah. I, look, I, I haven't specifically had anything. Any, the work that we've, we've done um, recently hasn't really uh, had to encounter that. We, we do have um, a lot of, um, obviously, being part of much, much part of, part of the immersive world now. We've got a lot of surveys and a lot of um, pulse surveys that we throw out all around the world to organizations that have um, workforces that can't work from home and, and workforces that can work from home. So we do have, we will have a perspective on that as from the wider immersive world. Um, so maybe um, 
Marty, we can use this as the follow-up materials to, to direct people um, who are interested in, in, in that topic to, to really understand a bit more of how we can um, address workers that can't work remotely. Um, you know, I think the nature of the work that we, we currently do doesn't necessarily work with organizations that, have, that can't work from home, but we do have the ability to provide that information. So um, we'll follow that up after this session. I think just to add to that um, a little bit as well, Gareth, is one of the things that we're seeing through those surveys is that people are apprehensive about travelling into um, an office location. And so what uh, organisations have been thinking about is what can they do to be quite overt about how safe their, their, their workspace actually is um, and, and what that means for individuals coming into the um, into the workplace. So when you are looking to source talent and they do need to be on site, make sure that is something that is quite um, quite clear. Do you know how safe is your workspace? How how um, how the each individual employee is enabled um, to to get into uh, that environment as well. Absolutely, Vicky. So yeah, the communication is uh, is absolutely key. Uh, Over communicating, and um, I know that uh, yeah, many suppliers and retailers are sort of reassuring uh, their customers as well uh, that it's a safe environment to uh, to be in um, so yeah good good observation um, we've only got a, a couple of minutes left uh, three minutes so um, before we close and uh, there, there may be some questions that we haven't quite got to so we can uh, certainly provide some information post this on anything that's been missed but I think we've covered most things um, but before we close I thought it would be worthwhile asking the panel for a key message or takeaway um, to share. Um, so I'll start with, uh, with you, Vicky, um, uh, a key message from you. I think the key message I would, um, I would share is think about your internal talent teams, think about your EVP and absolutely look and consider what your candidates experience is in this current time. Think about the information that you're able to share with them and how open and transparent you're able to be. Thanks, Vicky. Jared, uh, over to you. Yeah, look, for, for mine, it's uh, it's probably care and empathy for the people that you work with, uh, your peers, your subordinates, uh, your one-up managers. Everyone's facing significant challenges. We're, we're going back to, well, it's certainly in Victoria, uh, schooling from home. Um, it's going to put tremendous stresses and challenges on, uh, on a number of families. So I think, you know, the immediate immediate piece is, is that for mine. Um, and then obviously just as organisations as you go to market is being really clear around your messaging as, as Vicky says, your EVP and so on. Thank you, James, over to you. Uh, yeah, so we are, this is, you know, talent acquisition and, and, and the reinvention of talent acquisition over the, the, the next few horizons is actually absolutely front and centre for us. So. To that end, we're actually uh, creating a, a survey globally, um, looking at specifically, you know, changes to talent acquisition, um, you know, the operating model, where it is in the maturity curve, um, team performance, sourcing practices, um, and of course, the future of TA. So um, keep an eye out for that, and uh, hopefully we can get some great responses. Great, thanks, James. And um, okay. yeah, I think um, mine's um, consistent with the theme. My theme to that this today is um, is about leadership. So um, I think companies need strong, brave leaders um, at this moment in time. Um, even if they're not at the top right now, if they're hidden in your organisation, find them. Uh, if they're not, go outside and find them. I think it's. Um, it's going to be key for the success of an organization going forward. So, um, you know, that's, that's my key for today. Great. Thank you all. And um, most of all, thank you to all of our audience today. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, we've had some great participation, some really interesting questions, and um, uh, we hope that it's been really worthwhile for you. And uh, we hope to see you at future events. Um, uh, we will have some links to share with you. Uh, following this, um, so resources uh, will, will be provided and um, you'll also